My name is Simon Jodinantel, and I'm better known as Simon. Um, and I'm originally from uh, up north, and uh, from farm background over there. Um, did my PhD in Kentucky, and now I'm trying to find a balance in Wisconsin. Ended up being it. Um, good. So I want to talk about farm culture today. I just want to kind of lay down uh, the foundation, get us thinking about what is farm culture or organization culture in general. I want you to do a little bit of introspection in trying to find out what kind of cultures you've dealt with and what kind of culture you may have in your organization and talk about um, what it can do for you um, and also some pointers in terms of how you can influence that culture, uh, how you can work with that. Uh, but I will rely on both Paul and Jordan to provide you some more pragmatic examples from uh, the agribusiness side and the farming side of things. But I want to lay down the foundation. Uh, I, I put the subtitle, Sharing the Good with Your Employees. Part of that is I sincerely believe that um, if all of you are involved with farming or with agribusiness, is because you felt good in that environment. And the idea of developing a good culture is that how do you share that same feeling that, that brought you to actually stay in agriculture, or stay on the farm, to want to take over the farm? How do you share that with your employees? How can you replicate that so that they would also end up wanting to stay with you and wanting to be part of your organization? So how do you share that? And what is it, finally, what is it that you're actually uh, sharing? So organizational culture, what do we know about it? Anybody knows anything about it? Besides what, uh, what, what uh, Jim mentioned earlier on? It's kind of a fuzzy thing. Uh, we know it exists. Um, we know it's important. There's, uh, as we'll see, there's a bunch of research that has linked culture to a number of things like retention and things like that. You can't really define it. Everywhere you go, every scholar you go, the definition is going to be slightly different. Every consultant you go, it's going to be slightly different. So it's kind of hard to pin down, which is why I'm going to rely on a little bit of introspection for you, because that's how I could find out for myself what does it really mean. I have to look back at my own experience and I'll share some of those experiences and how different things were in different environments. And that then helps you, like, what kind of environment do you want to have? Um, some attempts at defining culture. It's how we do things around here. How do you do things? Uh, I know because I've heard from Paul, I know he's got some great examples. Um, there's one, I'm not going to mention it. If you don't mention it, then I'll bring it up. But there's one that struck me. Like, nowhere else would you find that. Uh, and you not think that you would find that in a cheese plant. But uh, it has to do with values and social norms on your farm. Social norms are basically what is accepted by the group in terms of behavior. Um, and your values, so what are your values? In terms of how you treat others, in terms of how you treat your environment and how you relate to communities, what are your values? Uh, with respect to new technologies, with innovation, where do you stand? So that's going to be part of your culture. Um, it has to do with common behavior that you can observe at your, in your workplace. So if you want to find out about your culture, one thing you can do is just to people watch. Sit down at your place of work and see what are people doing. And if you see some repeated behavior or things that, I kind of see that here, but I don't necessarily see that elsewhere, that may be the uniqueness of your place of work uh, and part of your culture. People show up on time. I have one anecdote regarding to place of work of mine. I didn't work very long there one day. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I did not list that on my CV when I applied at Google as well, so maybe... You know, you important late. <laughs> What's that? You important late. That late. I'll talk more about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I chose not to show up the next day. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, Do your people believe how long to help each other out? Is this something common in your organization? Uh, do they boast about their performance and people brag about, you know, I managed to do so much in so little time. Do people brag about that? Is that something important in your culture? Uh, people laugh together or not. So all those are just examples of kind of behavior that you can look for and that will give you some hints about where your culture is at. Okay? Um, but as, again, it's kind of hard to define some examples of cultural dimensions. What type of control? So who's in control? Who's taking decisions? Who's planning? Who's deciding on what's going to happen? Is it very much top down? Follow orders and the processes. You have SOPs. There are defined ways in terms of how to do things here. It's been decided by higher up. That's how we do things. Maybe the greatest example is military. Um, again, that's one aspect of your culture. And I don't know that there's necessarily, one thing to mention is that I don't know that there's necessarily one good culture. There are different cultures and there are different people that will feel good in different cultures. So you have to think about what is my culture and who do I want to attract and does it fit? And we'll talk more about that when we when it gets to hiring. Uh, but the first thing is to know and the first thing I want you to do this morning is to think about your own culture so that you know what you have and you know what you're working with. How competitive is it? Do you reward performance? Or do you reward growth? Or do you reward uh, teamwork? Or is it individual performance that you're rewarding? Um, in pro sports, it's very much competitive uh, and it works fairly well. At least uh, every year there's one team that's gonna win. Uh, but that's one aspect. Collaboration and vision. Working together towards a shared goal. That's another aspect. Is that an aspect of your own culture? Is that something that is reflected in your organization? One example here would be doctors without borders. A lot more collaborative, a lot more idealistic. They have a lofty goal, an ideal. Everybody's striving for that. They kind of have that shared vision that they're going for together as a team. Completely different than what you would experience in the military or in pro sports, right? And then you've got people that will feel good here, others that will feel good here, others that will feel better here. Um, so those are some, some dimensions uh, of culture. They say that strong organization culture tends to have more a focus on performance, so output and achievements are valued. That tends to be one of the traits of quote unquote good cultures. There's some elements of focus on being able to achieve, rewarding that. Autonomy, in other words, having employees that take pride and ownership in their own work. They own it. That's one aspect of a strong culture. The other one, which I think is especially uh, relevant here when we're talking about farms, is passion. United by a common purpose, which is not profit. Is there something that drives people? Uh, we'll talk about, I'll show you some, some examples, um, but when, how many of you how many of you have a vision and mission statement in your organization? Most people, that's good. How many of you know the vision and mission, oh, 
the vision statement of Rosie Lane? Huh? Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know it. Because I've seen it, I, I don't know, I think I've seen it about 10 times since I walked on the farm. On the bench outside and on the walls, everywhere. Uh, great people, great cows, great returns. Okay? Um, so, but to me, like, people in farming, in agriculture, are passionate. It's a hard industry, it's a very competitive industry. I remember discussions with some of the farmers and one of them told me, we are victims of our own passion. There was a large uh, crop farmer back home and he was talking to me about uh, the value of land and that he was going to buy that piece of land anyways, even if the value was way too high because the next generation wanted to come in. Like, victims of our own passion. People are passionate. There's a reason why you actually want to stay in agriculture, because there's this passion. Well, how is that reflected in your culture? Are you able to share that with your people? I mean, that's one of the biggest challenge, because we have that. As a kid, I wanted to be a dairy farmer. I couldn't because my dad was a financial manager, financial uh, advisor, and he looked at me and he said, that. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, there's such a thing as quotas back home that you have to buy and whatever. But, but there's a passion, right? How do you share that? Are you able to share that? Your vision statement is one way that you can do that. It's one piece of communication. There's a bunch of other pieces of communication you can have, but if you're doing that, it should be reflected in the culture. Your people should be somewhat passionate, somewhat engaged in what you do. We'll talk about that engagement. What cultures have you been a part of? And that's where I want you to think about different places you've worked at, different 12 organizations, because as soon as you have a few people together, it's part of a group, whether it's work, whether it's a hobby, it's a club, it's a church, you have a culture. You have a small group that have social norms that says, here, it's okay to do that. So I want you to think about all those clubs, all those things, and maybe some examples that some of your peers have shared with you about their place. Maybe they've talked about their employees or how they do things in their club or and that struck you. So how different are all those those places you've been at. Um, how different was the culture? Can you think what were what were the main differences? How differently did it make you feel? So I'm gonna share my own examples. Um, but I want you to think about you know your own place of work, but also all the, the other places you've been at. So you can start comparing, start figuring out, okay, this is what's unique about where I'm at now. And that's kind of what defines your culture. Um, my example is the slaughterhouse. That's where I worked for one day. <laughs> okay? Um, about one mile from my dad's place, there's a hog slaughterhouse. Hog is a big thing back home. Hog and dairy. Um, and you have to understand, so, so that summer I was in college, I thought I had an internship all lined up, and it fell through like within a few weeks of school ending, and I was like, where am I gonna go? And I was like, well, one mile away, there's a slaughterhouse, there always be people. So, up I went. Um, and you have to understand that before that, I spent my teens working on my, with my uncles on farms. So I had, you know, I thought I had, good work ethic. I knew what it was to work long hours, to work physically, and all of that, and I end up at the slaughterhouse, show up in the morning, they show me around, you're going to be on the line, so you see, you see the hogs coming on the chain, hung up, and then, and then by the time they get to me, they're all in small pieces, and they're saying like, this is the piece that you pick up and you put it in that box. 
So that's your role, you pick that piece, put it in the box. And there's like 40 of us on the floor. So I do that all morning, and comes lunch. Everybody, the train stops, clean up. Everybody goes to the cafeteria. I live a mile off, so. So I go home, and I didn't bring lunch. So, so I go home, uh, there's nobody home, my dad's at work, so I do my stuff, I eat. It's like uh, 10 to or something like that, and I'm like, better get back, which I do. So I park in, walk in the building, and then you have to put on the boots, uh, whatever, the, the hat and whatnot. By the time I walk on the floor, it's 102. Which by my standards, working with all my uncles, it's like, hey, you know, it's no big deal here, right? I got yelled at. Pretty bad. I was reminded, somewhat harshly, that the line starts at 1. Your spot is there. Okay? We need everybody in their spots at 1. No 102. Stress level went up. You know, we're talking about control, top down, follow the process. That was a very regimented, very structured place of work. And I looked around in the 40 some employees that were there. They were not all good guys. I remembered seeing some faces. I'm like, yeah, that guy was a dropout. The tree wasn't dealing drugs at the high school or something, <laughs> kind of thing. You know, like, I did not feel quite good there. I was used to working hard, long hours, but it was always with my uncles, with my aunts and their employees, I was always treated like a person and always addressed. You know, and there's no yelling at people in my family, so. So that very structured culture, top down, very strict, I did not feel good at all. Luckily, I got back home at the end of the day and uh, there was a few messages on the voicemail from other people that wanted to employ me and so I moved on. <laughs> so that's, that's how it happened. But to me, it gives me one example of one culture that existed there. It was very structured and maybe it worked for the type of people that worked there. They needed that structure, that top-down, Okay, UW are at Pentecon, where I work right now, and we have some students here from there, so I don't know if they can attest to what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, very much student-centered, very collaborative. We have a road where all of our offices are, there are seven of us, faculty members there, we collaborate. We want to help each other out. We understand that we all have our strengths and weaknesses. Some of us are better with commodity marketing. Some of us are better with finance. Some of us are better with uh, other aspects of economics. We work as a team. We want each other to succeed. We feel like we've invested a lot when we bring someone in. We've invested a lot in that person already. We want that person to succeed. And we're all focused on one goal, which is to serve students. I was told by my dean when I first walked in, my dean told me, if you have a meeting with me at 10, but a student shows up at your door at 9.55, screw it. You'll be late at my meeting. It's okay. Stay with the student. That's how, like, social norms, it's totally okay for us to be late to other meetings, to faculty meetings or whatever, if the reason is a student. That's a strong value that's communicated very strongly within our, within our group there. And that gives us, you know, you're talking about being united with a sense of purpose that is not profit, student success which I like when then I meet some students and the employers say, that's working out really well. That gives me a, I'm engaged. 
you know, we'll talk about it, but that sense of purpose makes you engage in terms of that place of work. And it's very collaborative. Uh, I'm going to talk to you, my hobby is cycling. I do a lot of cycling. At least five times a week. Um, cycling groups, every group, that's one thing we'll see, every group can have a different culture. When we do cycling, we sometimes we go very far. Like, we can do 100 miles, okay? So in most times, in most groups, we care for one another, we'll wait. If you have a flat, mechanical issue, you're not feeling good that day, we'll try to take care of each other, right? Except on Tuesday night. Tuesday night, performance centered. Tuesday night is the drop line. If you drop, you're on your own. It's very competitive. You earn respect if you make it back home with the main group. If you didn't get dropped, then you earn your stripes. It's a little bit like pro sports, we're not professionals. Although the other day there were some professionals. <laughs> that was hard. That was hard. Um, but anyways, I love that. But there's a stress that comes with it. When I gear up on Tuesday night to go to my ride, there's a level of stress that comes with it. I can take it because it's one day a week and it's a hobby. If it was my day job, all the time, every day, I don't know, I would need a full-time psychologist to keep me going, I think, okay? But those to me, those to me are some examples that highlight to me different groups and completely different cultures. And hopefully you can do a similar exercise with the different groups you're part of and that can help you highlight what kind of culture you're dealing with. And that can also help you highlight how it makes you feel. Because as Jim mentioned, the important part at the end of the day is how does it make people feel? If you have a strong culture, it should make people feel good. And that becomes your tool, the way you can differentiate yourself. If you're producing, Grade A milk. There's a lot of other people producing grade A milk. It's not what's going to differentiate you. So as a business, if you want to differentiate yourself, having a strong culture is a key piece. It's monetarily, it may not cost you much. It's going to cost you in terms of time trying to understand what you're working with and trying to change that culture. Some examples, Southwest Airlines is often quoted as being a good example of a strong culture. Um, they mentioned that they asked employees to do the artwork, to values, perseverance, uh, the one proactive customer service, and lighthearted fun. And they encourage uh, people to have fun at work. Managers are encouraged to hire for attitude and training skills. That's one example of a strong culture is Southwest Airlines. Uh, they also mentioned Adobe. Anybody knows Adobe? They do software. So uh, they encourage creativity, creativity and communication, uh, but they provide outlets for them. They provide group, they provide social groups to favor communication. Their value is communication. They walk the talk. They actually provide some outlets, some groups to actually put that in practice. And that's one thing, if you identify what you stand for, your values, what you, what you want your culture to be like, the next step is, how can I help them implement that, and make that a reality and walk the talk? So Adobe provides some of those examples. Johnsonville is also another one. How far are we from Johnsonville? Less than 10 miles. Less than 10 miles? Yeah. So most people around here probably know about it. Yeah. They're often also cited as having uh, a good, strong culture, a place where people actually want to work. They say they want to be the best company on earth that also happens to make sausage. Mm -hmm. Okay? But the thing is, you know, it's all about we at Johnsonville. They want to be more collaborative. And they have more responsibility to create and maintain an environment 
that requires each member to fully develop their God-given talents. Clear focus on people, on them developing their possibilities. That's clearly identifying their values and sharing that. Okay. They know what they stand for. They've been able to articulate it as part of a vision. And they're able to share that. That makes them, that gives them a strong culture. And from what I understand, it makes people want to stick. What I understand is that people want to work there and they don't want to go away. If you're watching any sort of TV, you've probably seen their ads that have been supposedly designed by their employees. Or the ideas came from the employees. Uh, some other things to consider. Even if you have one culture, or you think you have one culture on your farm, chances are each team may have their own subculture. So if you have some teams at your workplace, you can think that each of them may behave somewhat differently. They each have their own subculture, so it's not monolithic. And the key thing is how employees or members would feel it and perceive it. Today, you might reflect on it and think, I think this is the type of culture I have at my workplace. I think we're very collaborative. I think we care about people more than we care about performance. Not that we don't care about performance, but... And maybe you come up with all those ideas. But the reality is, do your employees actually feel it that way? And for that, you can have that as that. What does it look like on your farm? So what are the sound features of your, of your culture? How does it compare to other farms? What is different at your farm? So when you hear the stories from your peers, what is different at your farm? Is there anything different? And is that a good thing that is different than your problem? Uh, how do you think your employees feel about your culture? And we'll go, um, do your employees know your values, vision, and what your farm stands for? I remember, um, I remember going to, working with a, a fairly large farm, 3,000 some cows, working with the mill managers over there. And I can't recall what was the topic, but one of the mill managers uh, shared a story of him being at a local store and bumping into someone and, and having a conversation. And, um, and the person can say, oh, you work for that large farm over there. And right away, the employee started to stand for its farm and says, no, no, over there, you know, we, we want to produce some quality stuff, we stand for, for clean, we want to be clean and everything, you, you'll never see trashes around our farm, we'll be, and right away he stood for that farm. That employee knew what that farm was standing for and was willing to defend it. To me, that's an example of a culture that actually works. Uh, would you be able to say the same of your employees? Do they know what you stand for? How many of them have turned down an offer, turned down offers from other farms or businesses to stay with you? That's often time, that's often time to tell tell sign of whether you have a strong culture. If you have a strong culture like we were talking about Johnsonville, people are gonna turn down offers from other from other businesses. So that's one question to ask from your own business. Would people go away? If the neighbor offers 50 cents more, 25 cents more, are people running away? If that's true, it probably means that that magnet that should be your culture is not quite as strong as it could be. Okay? Um, why does it matter? Well, first of all, there's this cost of distress to you and your employees. It is, uh, it's important that good culture or stressful culture are related to health and performance. So if your culture is good, makes your employees feel good, 
then they're going to have health, less health issues and higher performance. The other thing is the cost of disengagement. Engagement, do they feel valued, secure, supported, and respected? I felt, I told you, towards UWR or after the extension, I feel engaged. I feel valued, feel supported by my peers. I'm engaged. Disengagement, what does it mean? Absenteeism, accident, errors. It's been shown that disengaged employees are more absent, cause more accident and errors. So that's the cost of disengaged employees. Those that stick around, they still show up. Well, most days. <laughs> they still show up. They're still on your payroll, but they're disengaged. When they talk about your farm, unlike that employee that I was talking about, that at the local store he was willing to stand for that farm, that employee is not going to stand for you. He might talk in your back, or he might say not so good things about your place. But more, more likely, he's going he's to create all those things. Even if he sticks around and he's on the payroll, and you count him as one of your employees. Then the turnover is those that leave. Cost of turnover, it's usually the highest cost related to HR. Um, recruiting, hiring costs, so whenever somebody leaves, how much does it cost you to find somebody else? It's going to vary. It's going to be hard to put one number on that. Okay? Because if the person leaving is the employee that just came in three weeks ago, that doesn't have much training, much experience, and you didn't know if he was a good fit anyways, then the cost of turnover is not that high. But if it's your guy that's been around for 10 years, he knows how to troubleshoot your robotics or other equipment you have, he knows everybody else on the team, he used to be the captain of your softball team, that guy leaves, that's a big job. So it truly really depends, but recruiting, hiring, cost retraining, if they don't show up, the stress related to that, if they just decide that, you know, just like I did with that smaller house, then the next day they're like, oh, that's what's open. So no, only for two minutes for a whole day. <laughs> uh, so what can a strong culture bring to your farm? They say that the secret to high performance is not money, it's intrinsic motivation. Anybody knows what intrinsic motivation is all about? As a, what's that? It's important to the individual. What's important to you? As opposed to extrinsic motivation, which would be? The organization. Huh? Not necessarily. The key thing is to try to align what the organization wants and values and what the person also values. You can align those things. That's great. We'll see. Uh, the secret to high performance is not money, it's that. I agree with this. I also think that uh, intrinsic motivation becomes more and more relevant and money becomes less relevant as you go up the pay scale. At the very basic level, when somebody is being paid minimum wage, money tends to be important. But it doesn't mean that intrinsic motivation is not important. Okay? Uh, I have this graph here on the left. A motivation, I don't care. Okay? The other side, intrinsic motivation, I just like it, I think it's fun. I'm not sure if it's realistic to think that, you know, think of all the chores in your organization on your farm, shoveling manure or whatever else. I'm not sure there's a lot of people that kids have just like it. Okay. But that's intrinsic motivation. That's the stuff that you would do by yourself just because you enjoy it. I'll make myself suffer on my bike just because I like it. Okay. I'm here. Uh, extrinsic motivation, it'd be the carrots and sticks. Here on the left, you can talk about monetary stuff, bonuses, raises, um, 
just avoiding making your boss angry or getting fired. Those are extrinsic motivation. In the middle, you've got avoiding being guilty, uh, feeling guilty, feeling better because you've worked hard. You have a feeling that you've spent a good day at work. Uh, Self-worth. I'm doing a good job. It's worth something. And here, because I care, because I think it's valuable, because it's important. One example of that could be a nurse taking care of a patient, his patient. They think, I mean, helping somebody is valuable, it's important. They won't necessarily clean them because they think it's fun. Yet, they're going to do it, right? And they don't necessarily need a boss watching over themselves to push them to do it. They know it's important. They know it's valuable. One example that I sometimes give to farmers is to say, if you have an employee and there's some trash right there in the ditch, if you're not there to watch them, will they pick it up? If, if you need to be there for them to do it, they're right here. They're motivated by not making you hang if they will pick it up because they know that having a clean environment is, is valuable, it's important, and it's one of the things that you stand for, they're here. If they know your values, if you have a strong culture and you've communicated that passion, those values, they're more likely to be here. And even if you're not watching them, chances are they'll do it. That's what a strong culture can do in terms of motivation, engagement. Okay? Questions? How many of you feel good about your culture? Jordan? Good. Uh, <coughs> recruitment and retention. Um, if, you can, if you can articulate what's unique about your farm, then that becomes your selling point. 500 cow farms that produce grade A milk. There are less than there used to be, but there are still a large number of them in the state. What makes you unique? What makes you unique? It becomes a selling point and a way to differentiate yourself. So there's a little bit of marketing there. And there's a lot of research linking culture to employee engagement, loyalty, and performance. Developing a strong culture, it's cheap. It doesn't require you to buy equipment that's worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe it requires you to attend one of those meetings and to do a bit of introspection, maybe to uh, meet with some consultants. But I like that one. How do you go about changing it? And the first thing is the challenge for employers to understand enough about your own culture to be able to sing your own tune. Do you understand what you stand for? Can you articulate it? It's, it's not easy. There's research that says that that part of our feeling lies in, in, in the primal part of our brain. And that primal part of our brain is not necessarily well connected with language. So going from emotions to language, not easy. But that passion you have, those values you want to embody, can you articulate it? If not, you cannot sing the tune. If you cannot sing the tune, who's going to know about it? Uh, is there a unifying vision, set of values that are central to what you do? First thing is to find that out. Are those articulated or communicated? As I said, having a statement like this posted everywhere is one way to do it. Another way to do it is just when you talk about your farm when you talk about your business, or when you talk about your business versus that of others. When you're at the lunch table and you say, so-and-so came in this morning, and people ask, who is so-and-so? Well, he's got a farm, but he does those other things, and we do it this way. That's one way to communicate how different you are and what you actually stand for. Not to say that the other person is wrong, but they stand for something else. 
What do you stand for? How do you communicate that? Uh, you can hire to build and maintain a culture. So they say when you hire, you should try to find out if the person is going to fit into your culture. One example would be uh, if you're a conventional farmer, you're trying to hire someone, and the person is a well-known environmentalist working on organic farm or something. Are the values going to line up with what you do if that's not what you stand for? I'm not saying one is right, one is wrong, but maybe they don't match together. So, the hiring process, but how many of you can be very picky with employees right now? Can you? Getting better. Getting better? Most people, like a lot of farmers that I've talked to, and I, I don't know, I think Paul, you might, you might agree with that. You cannot be that picky with the people you're going to hire because the labor market is very thin. And then the other thing you can do is to train people. So if they don't have uh, what you're looking for, the question is, can you train them? For skills, you can train them. For values, at least you can make sure that you share them and you, you make an explicit effort to show them why, in your view, that is so important. What's the importance of, of what you stand for, how you're doing it, how you're going about it? You can explicitly show them why. That's part of the training. Did you ever ask yourself if the person was going to be a fit on your team? Not just skill-wise, but just being wowed by the fact that the person has 10 years of experience on another farm being the main feeder over there. Like, oh God, finally somebody who knows a little bit about it and that can come over my farm and just go right in. But are you going to fit? In terms of culture, uh, do they share similar values? Do their personal goal fits with your farm's goals and mission? But you, first of all, you have to know what, what you stand for here. How can you educate them to understand those values that are important to you? I think we're going to get some good examples from the speakers today. But those are some of the things that you can do. Uh, find the supporters, so I can't stress that enough. Do that introspection, know what you stand for. Know what you want to have. Communicate them. Vision statement, feedback. How good are you at giving feedback, at talking to your people? That's a primary way to actually communicate your values and what you stand for. Walk the talk. If you're saying that one of the key values that you have is to be family-like, we care about <coughs> each other, right? We're going to work as a team, and you know, this used to be a family farm, and that's why I liked it, because we were, we were a family, and now I want to extend that and be like a family, and be just, we care for each other. Now, if your employee comes in and you start backstabbing the other employee, saying, like, how oh, bad, blah, 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 and, you know, Jim comes in and he starts talking about Trisha. <laughs> and if the first thing I do is to say, oh, thank God, you don't know what she did two years ago, and I start adding to that, okay, that's not going to work. Walk it up. Um, if communication is a key piece, ask yourself, how do I improve communication amongst my people? If family is a key thing, how do I get people to gel together? Do I create a softball team? Do I create, what can I do to help that happen? Walk the talk. The other thing, ask your employees. Ask your employees how they feel. What do they think is your culture? What do they think that it is that you do great? There's a number of culture assessment tools, okay? And there's a bunch of questions that you can add into that, but one of them is, what is it, asking your employees, what is it that this organization is great at? What is it that makes you feel good here, that you appreciate? Outside of the financial stuff, you know, 
outside of the financial system. Ask them that. If you have employees leaving, you can also ask them that. Exit interviews, that's important. Why is it that they leave? Is it because they were always stressed because you always had conflicts? Is it because they didn't feel good being in that top-down environment? Like I was at the slaughterhouse? Get to know that. Those are pointers in terms of what you can do to get to know your own culture. Um, that's about what I am at 10.59. Um, if, you have, if you have questions or remarks or if you want to share some of your own experiences, culture is a hard concept to get around, so that's why I want you to think about your own experience. But if you have some good ones to share, please do so. No questions. Yes. Well, 